Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome to the session again on uh, next steps in cell and gene therapy. Um, as moderator, I guess my job is sort of twofold. I'll begin by um, introducing the other panelists this morning. Um, we have three uh, experts that are all uh, world leaders in the field that will all be sharing with you examples of, of their work successfully taking novel cell or gene therapies uh, into clinical trials. Um, after myself, we'll hear from uh, Mikhail DeLuca. We'll be talking about uh, his work uh, moving forward, uh, stem cell therapies for skin disorders, in particular really debilitating uh, blistering skin, skin disorders. Um, we have Catherine High from the States who will share with you with uh, her work pushing forward um, gene therapy for blood disorders, including hemophilia. And finally, we'll have Peter Kofi from the UK who will be sharing with you um, some of his work um, with pluripotent stem cells for eye disorders, in particular leading cause of blindness called uh, age-related macular degeneration. Um, but before um, hearing from the panelists, I thought it would be helpful to, for me to give you just a little overview of the field. And if we're going to talk about uh, next steps in cell and gene therapy, I thought a good place to start would be how we got here, a little bit of a historical perspective um, in the field. And so this slide illustrates what, what I consider to be some of the, the major milestones in the development of, of stem cell uh, therapy uh, in the stem cell field. Um, I really trace this field back to, to really pioneering work in the early 60s by two scientists that we're really proud of in Toronto, um, Till and McCulloch, that um, identified a stem cell population in the bone marrow compartment of mice. And of course, now we understand that those are the stem cells that are really key in clinical bone marrow transplantation alike and are responsible for giving rise to all the circulating blood cell types. Um, if, as we move into the 80s, we have the advent of pluripotent stem cells. These are, of course, stem cells that are defined by the unique ability to give rise to all of the cell types in the organism, in the adult organism. Um, this began with the isolation of mouse embryonic stem cells from mouse embryos. Uh, later, as we move into the late 90s, we have the discovery of human embryonic stem cells. And then in the, the, the mid to late aughts, the discovery of induced pluripotent stem cells, which are a second example of a pluripotent stem cell type. Um, have properties very similar to embryonic stem cells, um, but are unique in that they're generated by reprogramming adult somatic cells or normal cells in the adult body into that special pluripotent stem cell state. And so there's obviously a lot of excitement about both these adult and, and pluripotent stem cell types. And the, the bottom half of this slide has just a, a few examples of what I consider to be some of the, the key milestones in the clinical application of stem cells. This work really begins with, with early work in the, the late 50s with bone marrow transplantation. There's further refinement of uh, that technology in the 60s and 70s, ultimately um, becoming sort of mainstream by the late 1980s. Um, and we have to move fully to 2010 before we have the first example of a um, clinical trial involving pluripotent stem cells. And as I think we'll hear from a couple of our panelists, there's been a real flurry of activity um, with these stem cell types in the last few years. Um, this slide uh, illustrates some of the um, key milestones in the development of a uh, clinical gene therapy. The first uh, gene therapy clinical trials um, were in the late 80s after some high-profile setbacks. The, there was a little bit of retrenchment for a while in the field. Um, and during that time, the field really uh, focused on improving the efficacy and safety of the viral vectors that are typically used to deliver these gene therapies. And there's been a real renaissance in the last decade or so, um, ultimately culminating in 2012 with the first um, uh, gene therapy product that was approved um, by regulators in the European Union. So there's a, a product called Glovera that's used for a rare heritable form of pancreatitis. And there's since been other um, successes in the field. It's not really reflected by this slide, but there's also been some um, examples of successful sort of combined gene and cell therapy with the advent of, of CAR T cells and the like. So there's been a tremendous amount of progress in, in both of these fields, in, in the, particularly in the last few years. But when I show timelines like this, one of the questions I often get asked is, why are the timelines so long? Um, if we just think about the example I, I shared of, of pluripotent stem cells, um, human embryonic stem cells were described, as I told you, in 1998. And here we are 20 years later, and there's not uh, FDA-approved pluripotent stem cell-based therapies. Why does this take so darn long? And that's where I thought this slide would be helpful, and that's just to underscore that the process of moving a, a, a novel therapy, any kind of novel th therapy, um, to the clinic is, is, is inherently complex and long. Um, it begins with a basic research phase where the scientist has the idea, they maybe do some in vitro work, um, and then ultimately move on to proof of concept studies and animal models. And it's during this basic research phase that there also needs to be safeguarding of intellectual properties, maybe patents filed, technologies that are that are out-licensed to industry. 
Um, and, and, and then and only then can you move on to this next phase, which is sort of a, a manufacturing and scale-up phase. And not only do we need to scale up the, the novel therapy to the quantities that would be required for human patients as opposed to, say, small animal models, um, we also need to convert um, that manufacturing process to entirely clinical grade, using clinical grade materials and the like. And this is, these are often um, uh, areas that are sort of beyond the, the expertise and, and capacity to do in academia. So this is often where you um, bring on uh, commercialization partners from, in, from industry and, and the like. Once you've got your clinical grade process locked down, then and only then can you move on to the preclinical studies. With that clinical grade products, uh, product, you do the toxicity and efficacy studies and, and relevant preclinical models to get the data that you're going to then need to approach uh, regulators like the Food and Drug Administration um, and other agencies um, for approval to move on to clinical trials. And if that clinical trial application is successful, then you can commence um, work in, in human subjects. And even the clinical trial process is complex and involves multiple phases. So we begin with small phase one studies in which we ask, is the therapy safe? And if it's safe, at what dose? Um, you then move on to so-called phase two clinical trials. Um, here you're asking, is the product uh, safe enough to continue testing it, exploring it, and and larger cohorts of patients. And for the first time, we designed the studies in a way to ask whether it might work, whether it might have an, an efficacy signal or not. Um, and then we move on to phase three studies where we're, we're asking in, in larger populations of patients, does, does the therapy work? So if you think about phase two the studies involving at most maybe a, a dozen or a couple dozen patients, phase three stu studies can involve many dozens of patients, hundreds, or in the cases of some therapies, even thousands of patients, so much larger cohort of population. Um, and then, of course, all these therapies need to be con continuously vetted after, after um, a approval. And so you can see this is a multi-phase process that's complex, it's lengthy, um, it obviously depends a bit on the particular therapy, but it typically takes um, on the order of a, a decade or more and sort of on average about a billion U.S. dollars investment to move an idea from the concept phase fully to, 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 to approval by regulators. And of course, that approval doesn't necessarily imply um, market penetration, that physicians are going to prescribe the therapy, that the payers are going to reimburse for it and the like. And we've had some examples of therapies that have been approved but then run into hurdles um, because of their expense. And all, all of these gene and, and, and clinical uh, and cell therapies that we're talking about are, are probably going to be inherently expensive. So I thought this, this timeline would be useful to share with you, and you can think as you hear from the other panelists, um, think about where to pin their work sort of along this, this trajectory. Um, in just the last um, one or two minutes, I just was going to give you a, a little taste for the, the, the work we're doing. Um, that's work that I would describe as in this, this preclinical phase, and so we have sort of a plan, if, if successful in that work, to move this um, into the clinic in something like a two to three year time horizon. And what we're focused on is, is trying to develop a, a pluripotent stem cell therapy for, for myocardial infarction, also known as, as a heart attack. And you, you all know what happens during a heart attack. You have a blockage in one of the, the coronary arteries in the heart, and all the muscle downstream of that blockage is, is susceptible to death. And it turns out the heart is probably about the least regenerative organ in the body. So that heart muscle is over time replaced by non-contractile scar tissue. And it's that loss of force generations, of, of pump capacity, that um, sets the, the patient often on a course towards a disease that we call heart failure. And many folks don't know that a, a diagnosis of heart failure is a really dire one. Um, on average, if you're, if you're given that diagnosis, you have a life, year, life expectancy of only about five years or so, which actually compares unfavorably with a lot of solid organ tumors. And, and, and currently, there's no medical treatment that allows you to regenerate a damaged heart muscle after a heart attack. We can, give um, medical therapies to, to ameliorate some of the symptoms of the disease and prevent progression of the disease, but the only way to replace the muscle that's lost is to give somebody an entirely new heart. And of course, there's nowhere near enough donor hearts to, to, to meet demand. And that's what's driven interest in, in, again, cell and gene therapy approaches. And the approach we're taking is, is we and many others in the field have, have identified um, protocols by which we can very efficiently guide the differentiation of human pluripotent stem cells <coughs> into heart muscle cells. And, 
And here I'm showing you what that looks like in a petri dish. We have actually upscaled this in Toronto into a true manufacturing process where we can make billions or even tens of billions of these cells, which is sort of the dose that we need to think about for, for human patients. And work I'll actually be sharing tomorrow here at the ISSCR meeting in Toronto, we've actually been testing these cells and what we think is the most relevant preclinical model with which to move these cells uh, forward into the clinic. And in particular, we've been transplanting these cells in a, in a pig model of myocardial infarction, have shown that these heart muscle cells will stably engraft in that model and will re replace a substantial portion of the infarct scar. And so we're really excited because we think, again, that this is the right um, animal model w with which we could move this work forward to the clinic. Um, so at this point, but I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up um, and introduce our, our first panelist, um, Dr. DeLuca, to come to the platform. Yes. Um, I'm going to show a few examples of the um, cell and gene therapy that can be done with the epithelial stem cells. but. I prepare a few slides to introduce, so there will be a little bit of overlapping, but not, not, not much, not much. Uh, regenerative medicine is an innovative advanced therapy, so the aim of this is somehow different from the classical medicine or surgery. We want to restore, regenerate a, a destroyed tissue. That's the aim of uh, regenerative medicine. And since many of the tissue, they self-renew, they renew. We change our skin every couple of months, the intestine every week, the blood may be every three or four months. We need the stem cells, but there is no one population of stem cells. It's a common mistake in the general population to think that there is one stem cell. There's many stem cells. There's a pluripotent stem cell, the embryonic, that give rise to all the tissue in the body. We have the somatic of adult stem cells that are responsible for the regeneration of that specific tissue where the stem cells reside. And that's what they do. They don't do other tissues. And we know by the work of Shinya Yamanaka that we can reprogram these cells and come back to the embryonic-like state with the IPS, which are important, the IPS, because uh, if you want to make a tissue out of the IPS that you should not uh, get into immunological problem because the cells are of the same patient. Now, among all these cells, stem cells, what, what is really in the clinics? What, what is really shown to help people in some specific disease? We have embryonic stem cells that are in clinical trials. Uh, Pete Coffey later will, will tell you about retinal cells that are derived from embryonic stem cells that are already in clinical trial for age-related macular degeneration. Next year or so, uh, in, in the next few months, uh, Malin Palmer, in, in, uh, she will start a trial with uh, uh, dopaminergic neurons made from embryonic stem cells, but are only at phase one clinical trial. There's also trials that started with IPS, especially, again, for the retina, and everybody is very curious, very anxious to see whether the clinical performance of those retinal cells coming from the natural pluripotent, like the embryonic or the IPS, they behave the same, you know, they, they give the same clinical results, which is not, not given for granted, you know, where to show this. And we have um, a clinical application in the hematopoietic and the epithelial stem cells. Why? Because the tissues are very simple. The blood is a fluid, is a liquid. The epidermis or the cornea, are, the epithelium is made is a sort of lamina, so it's sort of bidimensional. It's not very complex as a tissue. We know very well about the biology of the stem cells in this tissue. And this is why, and give you some example of this, this is why these are already in the clinics. Uh, there are other cells in clinical trials. I don't want to get into uh, some nonsense clinical trials or nonsense application of some stem cells around the world because that's not uh, 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 the right place to discuss this. I just want to give you some example of the uh, 
uh, good clinical application of the stem cells. Remember that the first clinical application whatsoever of any stem cell is, is dated 60 years ago with this, the work of, of Donald Thomas uh, that he really uh, uh, opened the field of bone marrow transplantation for leukemia. And now this is a technology that is used everywhere in the world and saved the life of many kids with leukemia. But it took about 30 years uh, to get another stem cell in, into the clinics. This was the pioneering work of Howard Green in Harvard Medical School in Boston. And not many people know that the culture epidermis has been the first stem cell therapy done with cultured stem cells. And in, in those years, those cells were not called stem cells yet. But now we discover after 30 years, and I'm going to show an example of this, that those are real stem cells that can regenerate this epidermis forever. And this was 1984. And uh, what we, what one of the things that we developed during the last 15 years is the regeneration of the corneal epithelium that M Michael was referring to in his slide uh, with, with the, with the uh, achievement of the corneal regeneration. And very, very simply, I mean, uh, here you have a destroyed cornea by birth where the limbus, where the stem cell reside, are lost, so the, all the cornea is lost. You see there is vascularization in his eye. And uh, these patients, they are obviously blind for this, and they have no much alternative therapy. But by using uh, a cultures of uh, autologous limbus stem cells, you can have this fantastic regeneration of the corneal epithelium. And this has been 15 years of work, but as Michael was referring to, in February 2015, the European Medicine Agency uh, registered this therapy with the name of Holocry. To my knowledge, it's the first stem cell-based therapy that has been approved, at least uh, in, uh, in Europe. And then one, once you have the, your stem cell in your hand, you know how to grow them, how to uh, control the proliferation, the self-renewal, the differentiation, so you know deeply the biology of the system. Then, at that point, you can go in gene therapy, so in making genetic modification of those cells by making what I call combined cell and gene therapy. And one of the examples, again, starts with the blood. Uh, this is a masterpiece work by Alessandro Iuti, published 10 years ago now, where he was treating uh, uh, um, other kid, uh, kids with immunodeficiency by, uh, um, due to adenosine deaminase deficit. And, and now this, the famous kids that live in the bubble, you know, they, they can go outside the world because they have no immune system. And now they, they go to school. But now the genetic modification of the uh, hematopoietic stem cells also by Ayuti, by Naldini, but by many other people in the world actually. I just give you examples of some landmark papers. But now this is very spread as uh, the technology. They are addressing many of the genetic disease uh, using uh, uh, transgenic hematopoietic stem cells. And uh, we are taking care in the last years of a devastating disease of, of, of the skin, that is called epidermolysis bullosa, where you lose the skin, where you have blisters and you lose the skin because of gene, uh, uh, gene mutations in, in genes that are responsible for keeping the epidermis attached to the dermis. So when, when these genes are mutated, you have different types of epidermolysis bullosa, the most severe being junctional and dystrophic, very poor quality of life, devastating skin blisterings, as you can see, with scarring and a short life expectancy. Obviously, being a genetic disease, yet you have to take the epidermal stem cell, you have to genetically modify it, and use regenerated in vitro epidermis, exactly as was showing you with, by Hal Green with, for the burns, to do replacement. And uh, I just give you one example of uh, uh, this kid uh, that, that was around the world a few months ago, uh, where uh, it was a very severe form of junctional EB. You see the situation 
of the skin where he had basically no skin, no epidermis anymore. He was dying. He was, uh, the prognosis was really, really bad. This was done in collaboration with a burn unit of the Ruhr University in Bochum in Germany. So we were growing the cells, making genetic modification, and we took the cells to the hospital in Germany. But now, it's almost three years follow-up now. The entire skin of the skin has been totally, completely regenerated, uh, starting from a very small biopsy, four centimeters square. We basically prepared the entire body surface of the skin. And now uh, uh, the kid is basically running a normal life with no single blister. This can be achieved because you know the stem cells, you know how to grow them, you know how to genetically modify, and you know how to translate this into the clinics, which is a crucial aspect of regenerative medicine, how to translate this into the clinical environment. And therefore, with, with, with my final slide, what I want to, to tell you is that it's not easy, regenerative medicine. You have to be careful about a few things. You have to have defined disease. Many people try to use undefined stem cells to treat all sorts of disease. That's wrong. We have to have a defined disease with a stem cell. Then you have to have a proper stem cell. The stem cells knows what to do in that tissue, so you have to use the proper stem cell. This is a rational, this is a basic science that is always been behind regenerative medicine. Then you have to have an adequate clinical protocol to transfer this into the clinic. And you have to have adequate endpoints and follow up to see what you want to see out of this regenerative medicine. And even though you do this very, very carefully, you usually have failures or success. And in both cases, I think, then you have to go back you have to go back to learn from the patients what the patients are telling you about the biology of the stem cell. So if you have a failure, go back to translation, go back to basic science and see what is wrong and how you can modify it. Remember that the first bone marrow transplantation led by Donna Thomas, all the kids died. There was something wrong there. But it took years of research to understand how to solve the problem. But even if you have a success, you have to go, in my opinion, back to basic science because the patient is teaching you a lot about the biology of the stem cell you are using. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Kathy High, and I am uh, the president and head of R&D at a company, Spark Therapeutics. And what we work on at Spark is gene therapy for genetic diseases. And this differs a little from what you've heard about in the previous couple of talks, because our product is actually a vector that encodes a specific gene. And the material is uh, manufactured at the plant, shipped to the treatment centers, and every person who's candidate for the product is injected with the same vial. So it's, in some ways, less complex than cell therapies because we don't actually need cells from the patient who's being injected. Instead, every person receives the same recombinant vector. So I'll just say that the you heard a little bit about the history of gene therapy from the previous speakers. Part of the hope of the Human Genome Project had been that once all of these genes were identified, it would eventually provide better therapeutic options for people who were born with serious genetic diseases. And in order to move gene therapy forward, there are essentially two main strategies that are used in gene therapy for genetic diseases. And one is the one that we work on at Spark. This is a, an AAV vector, and this has to be delivered directly into the patient. The other, as you heard from Dr. DeLuca, uh, involves taking, taking cells from the patient, genetically manipulating those in the laboratory with a different vector, a lentiviral vector or a retroviral vector, and then returning those back to the patient. So uh, Spark actually uh, was incorporated about five years ago, and the programs in the company were largely spun out from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia 
where we had had a unit established for about 10 years that was doing earlier stage clinical trials. As you heard from Dr. Laflamme, these were trials that started out in phase one, two, and eventually moved forward into phase three, or the pivotal testing, and it was really at the advent of the phase three trial for a rare form of inherited blindness that uh, we formed Spark Therapeutics because as the CEO of the hospital pointed out to me, Dr. Ha, what are you planning to do if this works? Because we're a hospital and we don't commercialize products. So um, Spark uh, uh, sponsored the phase three study, which was a randomized control trial for this rare form of congenital blindness. So to say a little bit about the disease itself, uh, it is caused by mutations in a specific gene called retinal pigment epithelium 65 kilodalton protein. We call that RPE65. And uh, the people born with this disease sometimes are diagnosed by the parents who notice that the baby is not tracking visually, and sometimes they're not diagnosed until they're further along. They may enter school able to function in a sighted classroom. By the second de decade of life, most people have significant visual impairment, and all these individuals will eventually go blind. So in 2001, uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Gene Bennett, had published very successful data in a, in a dog model of this same disease, where with injection of an AV vector into the subretinal space, she had been able to show that you could restore vision in these dogs. So that was the starting point for the work. The phase one, two study began in 2007 at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And by 2012, we were ready to start the phase three study, which took place at two institutions in the United States. The top line data were available in October of 2015 and showed a very compelling difference between the intervention group where uh, patients had undergone sequential administration of the vector into both eyes, separated by about a week in time, and the control group, who had gone through all the same evaluations, but without the intervention. And so then be, we began the process of trying to file for regulatory approval. So uh, in May of 2017, we completed that. There are event, essentially three sections to any regulatory filing to get approval. The, all the, the non-clinical or animal studies are summarized, all the clinical studies are summarized, and then all of the information about how the manufacturer ensures that the product is made in the same way every time, what are the tests that are done to release the material into, into use for patients. So all of that work is summarized in a document that in our case was about 66,000 pages long, and it was submitted to the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration in May of 2017. In October of 2017, they held what's called an advisory committee hearing where experts in many different fields, but all with an interest in uh, inherited retinal diseases and gene therapy, listened to all of the evidence and made a recommendation to the FDA unanimously that they approved the product. And in December of 2017, the United States FDA approved uh, this therapy for this ultra rare form of blindness. And this was the first approved uh, gene therapy in the United States for a genetic disease. So that was in December of 2017. And so as you also heard from one of the earlier speakers, there's a great deal of work that has to occur after the product is licensed. Uh, in this case, uh, there had to, had to be work educating the medical community because for all of this time, inherited retinal diseases have not been treatable with any pharmacologic agent. Uh, there had to be efforts to educate physicians and ophthalmologists to actually do genetic screening for the condition because there's now a treatable illness. Uh, and, of course, there had to be a great deal of work with uh, payers, both government payers and commercial payers in the United States, uh, to sort through issues related to pricing and reimbursement. Right now, the product is also in front of the regulators at the European Medicines Agency, and we expect a decision in the third quarter of 2018. So that's one uh, area where Spark is working. We have other programs following along behind 
also for inherited uh, retinal diseases. We also spend time working in hemophilia. And the results of our phase one, two trial for hemophilia B were published in the New England Journal in 2017 uh, at the end of the year. So as you know, this is a devastating disease caused by mutations in a gene for a clotting factor, factor eight or factor nine. Uh, and the, the work I'm telling you about now is for factor nine, but again, we can manufacture an AAV vector encoding factor nine, and that material is put into vials and shipped to the treatment center. And then uh, for the clinical trial, the vials are solubilized into about 200 milliliters of uh, normal saline, and that's infused intravenously over about an hour. And then uh, what we have described in the phase one, two study is that the levels of circulating factor nine slowly increase. It takes about six to eight weeks to come up to the plateau level. The data that we published showed an average plateau level of around 33% of normal. And I can tell you uh, as a hematologist, uh, we, we know from large studies of individuals with mild hemophilia that people with levels of around 12% essentially very rarely bleed. So these people had an average level around 33%, and we saw a remarkable reduction in the number of bleeds per year, about a 98% reduction, and in the amount of clotting factor, which is normally infused intravenously, so it's an intravenous infusion for the patient to treat himself with clotting factor, um, and that was reduced by about 97%. So these findings are uh, now we've, uh, we've uh, communicated that we'd seen durable expression out past two years in the patients who were initially infused, and this work is moving forward into phase three. Um, so at Spark, we work on other target tissues as well, but all of these have in common that the, the vector is manufactured uh, in a similar way for, you know, the only thing that changes really is the gene, uh, depending on what the genetic disease is, and of course the route of administration. So for the blindness product, it's actually administered in a surgical procedure, an outpatient surgical procedure, into the back of the eye, the retina. Uh, so uh, that's the kind of things that we're working on at uh, Spark Therapeutics. It's been very rewarding to see that work come to fruition and move through two licensed products, which can be made available to people uh, with these serious inherited genetic disorders. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Pete Coffey. I'm based um, in London and in California for my sins. Um, and basically my interests lie in the eye and people's visual health. Um, I think, given the last speaker, one of the issues in medicine is a completely new paradigm, that paradigm of regenerative medicine. The goal is not to maintain a patient's health as they come into a doctor's room um, in the state they are, but into some way to restore their health prior to the onset of that disease. That is the major goal of regenerative medicine. The eye has been a major area in regenerative medicine for not just uh, decades, but actually centuries. As you can see from the panel here today, and including myself, one of the obvious regenerative abilities for the eye is glasses. Just a simple prism can restore our vision in a way which allows us to drive, allows us to read, and it allows us to recognize as individuals, especially our loved ones. So this whole concept of restoring a person back to a state prior to the onset of disease has always been a major area within um, the eye. Uh, by far, one of the first and most um, productive methods at the moment is a simple cataract operation. So again, it's a mechanical procedure in that what we do is replace the lens in a patient's eye. But it's a 20-minute procedure 
which results in those patients regaining their vision, being able to see colours, and is now the most cost-effective procedure in the National Health Service in the UK. But that's a mechanical operational switch between a bad lens and then putting simply back a plastic lens. Biology is something to which regenerative medicine is hoping to make an impact. In disease and in pathology, can we in some way restore that person's biology? And Michaela probably gave probably the first biological way in which regenerative medicine was examined within the eye. And that was trying to make a lens, not a lens, sorry, the cornea clear again after either disease or after some type of an acid burn. So replacing the cornea, either with another cornea, or which is a major area for um, Michaela, is the ability to transplant cells which will regenerate that cornea. So the limbal stem cell procedures, which are becoming more common now. But my main area of research, believe it or not, uh, there's only half to an inch between the front and the back of the eye, but the number of specialists between those areas is astounding. And I'm, my major interest is the back of the eye, not the front of the eye. And there, there are a number of diseases which result in blindness in both the working population and in the aged population. And the one in which stem cells have been used and utilized is for a disease which affects the age population. People typically over 65, over 70 have a problem in that a single set of cells, a carpet of cells at the back of our eyes start to deteriorate and die. And those cells are essential for the healthiness or keeping healthy, the light sensitive cells which we need to see the outside world. So when those support cells die, what eventually happens is those light sensitive cells die as well. And it's a group of diseases known as uh, macular degeneration or age related macular degeneration. The reason this has been a major target is it is just one cell type that needs to be replaced. It is a single layer of cells. It's non-neuronal, so it doesn't have to connect into another network. So the whole idea was this was a very simple reconstruction of one cell. The question which has been going on since the 2000s, or the beginning of the 2000s, is how or in what way to replace those cells. And a number of groups have addressed this, both uh, in the US, in Europe, and in Japan, using a variety of techniques, but to commonly, with all of them, to replace those support cells. There's companies such as ACT, who have used uh, embryonic RPE by injecting the cells. There's the Japanese who've used um, cells taken from the patients themselves, made into stem cells and then turned into the eye cell that's affected. And there is my own group and a group in California which have used embryonic stem cells but on a carpet, on an underlay, on a patch to put them in the right form and the right structure to replace the cells that have died. I've not shown any slides today, but what I will be showing is our one-year clinical data, which shows the second patient, Douglas, who had that operation and was blind in his right eye prior to the transplantation he was given. He is now reading 60 words a minute, even though he couldn't see the book prior to the operation. I will occlude now the left eye. Can you let me Before know? his Can pioneering you? stem cell treatment, Douglas Waters was completely blind in his right eye. Now he can see. Everyone wanted to go outside when the 
rain finally stopped. That's perfect. So this is an amazing improvement, Mr. Waters. I just couldn't believe it. And each morning I pick things out in the bedroom to look out, out in the garden. I do this and it's unbelievable. I'm really chuffed, I suppose you could say. And so is his surgeon. Two patients with age-related macular degeneration had the sight-restoring treatment at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. We are able to show that we've taken someone who could not read at all, they couldn't in fact see the book that they were supposed to be reading from, uh, and taken them to reading around 60 to 80 words per minute with their normal reading glasses. For us, this is a fantastic breakthrough. The future... I think, if anything, as with the uh, gene therapies which have occurred for monogenic eye diseases, I think there is a great possibility now, given that there is some efficacy of the use of stem cells for a disease of the eye, that there will be a number of um, potential products, products being therapies and therapies that get into hospitals and clinics for patients very quickly in the next three to five years. Thank you very much. Okay, at this point we'll advance to the Q&A uh, portion of the session and maybe if I can use my uh, prerogative as moderator to start off with an obvious question. I think all three of our panelists shared example of advances that they contributed related to the eye and I don't think that is coincidence. There's clearly something special about the eye that makes it a good target for these novel therapies. So I'd open up to the panel, why the eye? Well, I think for uh, AAV gene therapy, the answer to that is fairly straightforward. Um, so first of all, there are over 200 genes involved in vision, so there are plenty of targets. Uh, secondly, it's a relatively immunoprivileged space, so our vector has to be administered directly to the patient. And for the field of hemophilia, one of the critical issues was that it was important to work out all of the immune responses to the recombinant virion, and then understand how to manage those in order for the work in hemophilia to move forward. If you use relatively small doses into the back of the eye, you're not really gonna be dealing with problems of immune responses because the retina itself is a relatively immunoprivileged space. And then third, I would say that, again, if you're dealing with small doses, the manufacturing challenges are relatively smaller than for indications where you're trying to transduce, let's say, all of the liver, uh, where the doses are gonna be much higher. So I think those are some of the advantages for retinal diseases compared to other target tissues. Um, I would say there's um, some fairly obvious reasons why the eye has been chosen. One is um, it's very accessible um, it's very easy to place things on the front of the eye. Um, it's a lot easier doing things on the front of the eye than it is the back of the eye, but it's still very, very easy, easily done. Second is we can see what's happening. We don't need huge magnets <coughs> for the heart or um, uh, any other body part. We can look through the window at the front and see what's going on. We can see what's happening on the front of the window. And um, in terms of function, we know what the eye does. It processes vision, it processes uh, light. Um, so again, if you start to look at, say, brain issues, we don't really understand the brain yet, whereas the eye is fairly, fairly well understood. And um, there's a lot of surgical and non-surgical ways of manipulating the eye very safely. And that is the other great um, concern, as in safety. Um, if things do go wrong in the eye, um, to be honest and be, to be truthful, it's not going to kill you. If something goes wrong in the brain or goes wrong in the heart, you've got a major problem. So in terms of this whole pathway to clinic, the eye is a great place to do it. Gene therapy, in terms of being proven, has definitely um, been achieved in terms of the eye and in terms of safety. 
Um, so I think it's, uh, it, it meets uh, safety, um, efficacy, and ease of um, treatment. It certainly makes sense. I see a question in the back. Yes, I was just impressed by all of the talks ab about the actual processes between getting something from the very beginning of understanding what's happening in it, in the different organs that were discussed, the eye and the heart, and then getting things actually every step of the way to a point where they're through clinical trials, um, and just the amount of n not necessarily work, which is a lot, but also the dollars and the um, investment in that. And I wondered how that works. Michael, you had mentioned about getting outside companies involved or, or working with um, companies or establishing companies. But could you talk about um, kind of the resources involved and the challenges in that regard? Maybe I'll open that up to the panel first. Yeah, well, I'll take that one. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Okay, well, uh, The old, the old way that this field has seen change uh, recently, uh, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, at least in Europe, uh, with a new regulation of the European community stating that those cell therapies and therefore gene therapies are drugs. And therefore, the entire way to look at this product changed. Before these rules was something that was basically done on an academic level uh, without any specific uh, or strong regulations. Fortunately, I have to say, for a number of reasons, including improper use of the stem cells, all the governments, they realized that this thing should be regulated. And obviously, they took the, uh, uh, what they knew, which is the drug, and therefore, initially, now there is a little bit of adapt, the regulations are sort of adapting to the, to the cell therapy. They define these advanced therapies that are treated as drugs. Therefore, all the, the production that should be done in GMP as a normal drug, all the uh, clinical development, which is phase one, as Michael will say, phase two, phase three, it expands a lot the time from a basic research, proof of concept, and registration, marketing. Uh, and also the money investment uh, should be very, very, very high, also because usually the academy cannot go there. I mean, you need the help of companies, biotech companies, pharmaceutical companies, to, to uh, that they have also the regulatory and development expertise in order to get an advanced drug on the on the on the market, the reason for this is that we should assure two things when we develop these therapies, which is safety and efficacy. Safety is important, but it's important efficacy also because, as Peter was referring to, the aim of regenerative medicine is something very ambitious. You know, we want to go b back to before the disease, we have to, to restore the tissue. So the efficacy is, is also very, very important. This will, will expand the time and the money in order to get there. Well, I, I think I would just add two things. I, I think that uh, probably <coughs> some of the greatest expense in the development of any drug is the work that goes into assuring that the manufacturing process can be carried out reproducibly and uh, result in the same product every time it's done. And uh, for, particularly for new therapeutics, and in, including new, whole new classes of therapeutics, which is what we're talking about here, then it often means that a lot of work has to go into not only validating the assays that are used for the lot release, but actually developing them to begin with. So the development and validation of a very comprehensive set of lot release assays is an expensive undertaking. So I think um, that's certainly 
one of the reasons that this whole process becomes expensive and becomes really difficult to do without access to the kinds of capital that you can access through the public markets. I mean, this is, you know, this is one of the challenges, I think, of drug development. And I think the other issue is that when you're working with classes of therapeutics that are addressing disease targets that have not previously had treatments, uh, then you may find yourselves in the position of having to actually develop the endpoints that are used for registration. And so with a disease, for example, like hemophilia, well, there's already a lot of agreement from protein therapeutics about what the registration endpoints should be. But for diseases like inherited blindness or age-related macular degeneration, there may not be good agreement about what should be used as the endpoints to support registration. And so then the, the drug developer may find themselves in the position that, again, not only do they have to develop the new endpoint, now they have to validate it. Well, all that costs time and money. Uh, typically high-level individuals, and uh, it's an expensive undertaking. So the only, the only thing I would add is there's, there's money to be had for basic research, which is right, because that's only where the new therapeutics will ultimately come from. But, and there's also uh, monies for clinical trials, but not necessarily the first clinical trials. So the big problem is, is how do you actually take you know, something which was at the bench in the laboratory and take it into the clinic and fund it? And it's risk. Um, and someone has to take that risk. And it has to take the risk once it decides it's going to manufacture, once it's going to actually produce the product, once it's going to do all the preclinical testing, that it has to take it into a phase one trial. And in that, has to be successful before it then starts to get further um, big funding. And in fact, one of the major problems in that process is the disease number. So, uh, for example, Spark Therapeutics' first um, uh, approved therapeutic is for a, what, what's deemed an orphan indication. So it's a rare eye disease. And um, therefore, very few, if any, farmer would have really have done any work on that and probably didn't really. Um, Yet, Spark has managed to take it all the way through by actually taking those risks and getting that money and now has a therapeutic which is licensed for a very rare disease. But again, those diseases deserve to be at least examined and, if possible, treatments made available for them. But it is very, very difficult. It's high risk, but there is a high return. I, I think that would be... Well, as, and as, as a matter of fact, if you, if you consider many of these, these diseases that people want to, to take with the, with the regenerative medicine and stem cells, most of them are rare diseases. So this will create a problem, actually, in terms of the cost at the end of these therapies, because you cannot you can't compare a drug that you use for high blood pressure, you know, for, for diabetes. So there are very few patients, they are rare disease, and therefore the cost is high. But what people usually do not consider is that, I take the example of the epidemiologist bullosa that, that I know very well, that the social cost of these patients mm -hmm. during these years is tremendous. So even though these therapies, if they, that's why I was saying safety and efficacy, because they have to work. Uh, will really change the life of the of these people. Also, from an economical point of view, you should consider that at the end, probably the cost of the patients is going to be less because of the high cost of these patients. Well, it's true for for many for many rare diseases. It's true for many rare diseases. I guess if we're talking about the economics of developing these novel therapies, we'd be remiss if we didn't emphasize the importance of of philanthropy and, and, and the governmental support, particularly for that basic science phase, because we've talked a lot about industry and how critical that becomes as a partner later on. But of course, the money that we get from funding agencies and from philanthropy really is providing sort of the seed corn for, for all of this work. So, um, Absolutely. Other questions that we have? 
if not, maybe I'll, I'll follow up with one. We're, we're in a session that's entitled Next Steps for Cell and Gene Therapy, and we've heard uh, about the elegant past work from the folks on the panel, but I, I'd be curious to know what do they, what do they regard as sort of the next steps in their specific projects, but also is there, is there something maybe outside of their immediate area of work that's got them really excited in the, in the field? Well, um, I, I can say that uh, we would certainly like to continue to exploit the lessons that we've learned for the development of uh, the product for RPE 65 mediated inherited retinal dystrophy. So we do have some follow-on programs for other inherited retinal dystrophies. Uh, I, I, we've been very heartened by the work going on in hemophilia. And I think it will lay the groundwork for uh, developing therapeutics for other diseases that can be addressed by making a protein in the liver uh, using a gene-directed approach to the liver. And so one of our next targets in, uh, at Spark is a neuromuscular disorder called late-onset Pompe disease. Uh, so this is a deficiency of an enzyme called alpha-glucosidase. And uh, we are using the liver as a way to make the missing enzyme. And then that's secreted from the liver into the circulation and taken up by cells, uh, by muscle cells throughout the body. And uh, again, the preclinical data are very compelling in this. And we look forward to uh, trying to exploit the ability of the liver to serve as a, uh, an internal synthetic factory for proteins that need to be distributed throughout the body. And then um, you, you, heard, uh, you heard Pete talk a little bit about the complexity of the brain, but it has been possible to introduce uh, gene delivery vehicles into focal areas of the brain and show uh, a therapeutic effect. And uh, you, you actually heard Michelle also talk about uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy. This is another uh, serious neurodegenerative disorder that presents in the pediatric population but it's been possible to use lentiviral transduction of hematopoietic stem cells, and then the modified uh, microglia eventually migrate to the brain, set up a shop there, and produce the missing protein to address very serious uh, neurodegenerative disorders that really need global distribution of the uh, cell and gene therapy product in the brain. So I think that there are, there are a very wide number of therapeutic targets that we that cell and gene therapy can attack now can can tackle uh, for really developing uh, licensed therapeutics. Well, from from my point of view, um, Graziella Pellegrini, the first day of the uh, of the of the meeting, was sort of making an overview. Uh, she, she was the one who really was following up on the cornea. We've been working together since 30 years. Uh, she made a sort of overview of what we have done in the cell therapy and gene therapy field in the last 30 years, uh, which is quite a lot. Now, now I have only, personally, I have only one goal, uh, which I want to bring the uh, ex vivo gene therapy to these kids with the epidermolysis bullosa because it's one of the most devastating diseases I've ever seen. And there are many isoforms, many forms of the disease, and we want to take all of them, and it's going to take time. So there, I have this focus. In terms of general science, personally, I'm very curious to see what is going to be developing in the next couple of decades, let's say, with the, this possibility of making, starting with the organoids, starting with the three-dimensional structures, and uh, whether it will be possible to combine different type of uh, stem cells in one complex uh, tissue or organ. Uh, we are working with simple tissues now, you know, because the hematopoietic is simple, the epidermis is simple, the cornea is simple, even, even the retina, you know, is, I mean, the, the, but what's going to happen with more complex three-dimensional tissue is going to be a challenge, and probably the combination of the stem cells is important. Although this development will, will generate a problem of translation, because it is easy to, to 
clinically apply an hematopoietic stem cell or a skin or a cornea because of the body size and the way you can transplant this. But for a full organ, there's going to be a major problem in translation. So for myself, um, given the results, which I will be um, showing later in this conference and from the video you'll see from this discussion, um, there's a major push in London and the London project now to uh, accelerate the therapeutic that we've developed into those pivotal trials, which allows it to become um, a licensed therapeutic, similar to uh, what Spark have for the RPE65 um, program. Um, but the London Project is taking a second form now, the London Project 2. So as Michaela says, um, I am a simple man, and um, the back of the eye is fairly simple. There's just three bits to it. There's a blood supply. There's uh, what's called a neural layer, which contains the light-sensitive cells. And um, there's the support layer, which we've already achieved and made and transplanted into patients. So the London Project 2 is going to build all of those layers um, for the very simple reason that if we can do that, we can not only um, um, restore vision in the largest population, uh, age population, um, in terms of AMD, that's the largest problem causing blindness uh, in an age population. But the largest cause of blindness in the working population is diabetic retinopathy. Mm. And again, that's due to the uh, blood supply. If we can restore that, then we can achieve that. And then for the neural layer, even with gene therapies, there will be patients who unfortunately, that um, light sensitive cells do die and as a result, we'll need some type of a cell transplant. So for those rare diseases where that is the case, or in late stage disease where those light sensitive cells have died, we aim to um, re-engineer. We have a different approach to uh, how we may achieve it from the way other people have done this. But again, the London Project, as you're likely saying, has only been uh, enabled to do that through um, two rather large grants from two um, philanthropic organizations, the Michael Uren Foundation and the Oak Foundation. But um, the London Project's coming back hard. <laughs> so there you go. That's, oh, and the major thing is to pass the baton on. <laughs> I'm not getting any younger. So um, the idea will be to uh, ensure that we... Um, can educate and get other people to take those projects forward as their own and for their own careers. I thought you were going to tell us that. One of the reasons the eye is special is that all stem cell and gene therapy scientists wear glasses again. <laughs> Maybe if I could uh, follow up on something that um, Dr. DeLuca mentioned in passing. You sort of alluded to g good stem cell therapies and bad stem cell therapies, and of course, all of our panelists have shared examples of work that has progressed with a lot of rigor from basic science work, a lot of work in animal models, to really well-designed uh, clinical trials. But we all hear about stem cell therapies that haven't necessarily gone through that degree of rigor. And so maybe the, the panel could comment on, um, is that a threat to the field? And, and maybe how somebody in the audience could recognize what's a, a good therapy versus a bad therapy. Uh, thank you if I jumped in here. There was um, the obvious case is Miami, um, where sadly three uh, women, um, whose vision wasn't that bad, actually. It wasn't that bad at all. Um, sadly, were injected with cells um, into both eyes. And uh, as a consequence, and the way in which those uh, cells were prepared, there was still detergent in the fluid that the cells were placed in, just basically and horribly resulted in their blindness due to it basically digesting the retinas at the back of the eye. Um, that is a catastrophic case, cases. Um, amazingly, though, they did have IRB approval. So it was a clinic that was set up. The uh, individuals who were performing the operations 
hadn't really any background in the area. They were ophthalmologists, obviously, but they weren't um, anyone who'd been doing any stem cell type work. Um, but it was something which had been seen by at least one ethics group. Um, and they injected into both eyes, which is unbelievable. We would never be allowed to do such a thing. Um, you only go into one eye, and typically it's the worst eye of the patient. Um, has it um, put back the research? I mean, fortunately, I don't think it has. What it has highlighted is the problems associated with unproven therapeutics, how in what way they should be managed. And I think recently here in the US, there's now um, the possibility that these therapies can be accessed even more uh, readily than before, um, which again is very surprising. I think the major um, thing that um, individual patients or individuals should do is as much research as possible as to whether those individuals who are offering these operations, A, are they charging? Because as you rightly say, these therapeutics aren't approved and aren't licensed. So why are they suddenly giving you something and then charging for it? Secondly, what is the background of their uh, ability and whether they've done any clinical trials themselves? And just discuss it with your own physicians um, please discuss it with your own physicians. But um, I think what can be highlighted is a good resource on the ISSCR uh, website, which actually details how or in what to look for in these types of clinics. And I think, I, I'm not sure whether it is still there, but I think there are a number yeah. of clinics which are oh, yeah. identified on oh, yeah. there as not appropriate. But if, 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 if I can add something to what Pete was saying, um, I, because if possible, I'm going to be a little bit even more harsh. than In some of these cases, the, the, there is not even the rationale to use those cells for that specific disease. So it's true that the case that you were referring to was a problem of manufacturing, probably. But if you think about it, there was no reason to start with those type of cells in that clinical situation. Yeah. And uh, that's why in, the, in one of my slides I was addressing the issue of the rational and the developmental biology and the cell biology behind the, any cell therapy you want to do. Now, why this happens? Well, this happened for a couple of reasons. One is that a few years ago, there were some, some papers that they were suggesting erroneously, erroneously that we have stem cells in our body that can do everything, which is not, simply not true. I mean, we have, we have <laughs> spe specialized stem cells that can do what they are asked to do. And this was a disaster from this point of view. And the other reason, unfortunately, I have to say this, is commercial. I mean... Instead of trying to find the therapy, many people try to find a product, not the therapy. Independent is whether that cell therapy is going to work or not. And I believe that one of the reason, one of the reasons why there are many people pushing to lower the regulations, and actually I've heard of proposal that people have done to the FDA, which is actually resisting in the States, of having a condition on approval based only on a safety instead of, of the efficacy, that is going to be a disaster. Because then you can inject anything in anybody as long as it doesn't it doesn't kill anybody. But <laughs> but, but this is that is not the meaning of regenerative medicine. Right? Okay? So if this goes through there is going to be a, a problem for the entire field of regenerative medicine. And this is something that we have to watch very carefully. I guess, is this a threat in the gene therapy field? I've asked Catherine. I, I, I've read lay articles about people hacking their genome, but is it, is it quite the challenge that, uh, that it is in the cell therapy realm? Well, you know, I, I 
do think that most gene therapy trials really are registered on clinicaltrials.gov. And I think it's a little harder in the case of gene therapy, we've got to manufacture a reagent to uh, set up shop to do it without approval. Right, so. uh, let, me, let me make a comment on this. The fact that we have a clinical trial registered in the clinical trial UGO, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not very diplomatic. It doesn't mean anything. Because, because if you look at those trials, you have, right now, there are 500 trials running on a specific use of, of a specific population of cells, which are actually not even stem cells, but nobody knows about the outcome of this trial, never. In the moment you register a trial, then it's like that what you're doing is a, is a value, you know, which is probably true, but the results should be reported, even negative results, because having a registered trial is not a guarantee of what you're doing as a rationale, as, you know. No, absolutely not. So ju just because it's registered on clinicaltrials.gov certainly doesn't mean it's going to work. It does mean you should be able to trace back to who is sponsoring it, yeah, well, and there should be an entity that you can connect to and ask questions. And w exactly, and, and then why we never see results published in all these trials? <laughs> well, you know, there are probably things that don't work, yeah. but at least you should be able to track who is sponsoring yeah, exactly, the trial. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Very pr provocative discussion, but I think a useful one. So I, I'm afraid we're out of time for this session, but I, I thank you all for your attention, and we thank the, the, the panel for the very informative discussion.